it's not really clear why they couldn't just get along and figure it out. Oh, I gotta catch my breath. Anyway, I put that paper in the link too. So, obviously, if we could magnetically control neurons, that'd be great. So, I don't want to doubt it, but these tools are tough to make and apparently tough to replicate. So, I'll keep you posted on it and we'll review it again when new data and new reports come in. But it is a very exciting possibility to be able to control the brain with magnets. Okay, welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. This is Journal Club on a Bike, I'm JC, and this is JC on a Bike. Today I wanted to cover the phenomenon of magnetic sensing in neuroscience. It's been known for a long time in biology that many animals, from monarch butterflies to pigeons, seem to have a directional sense. And it has been long hypothesized that the directional sense must come from a specific protein which changes conformation in response to the Earth's magnetic field or magnetic fields. And so there's been a long standing search for a magneto type receptor that would be able to sense very, very tiny magnetic fields in relation to direction and then, you know, be responsible for compass-based navigation in mammals. And there was a group in China that had claimed to have found this protein. The group was headed by a man with the last name XIEZ. Um, and at the same time, there was another researcher, Shengzha Zhang, who was starting his lab in another university in China, who apparently had some encounter with him in an academic setting and ended up exchanging the protein construct for this magnetoreceptor that Z's lab was working on. And that, uh, that exchange resulted in a paper in Scientific Bulletin, which was later retracted by Zhang and his colleagues and forced to contract, uh, retract it by the Chinese government. And Z accused him of stealing the construct and stealing the protein. And uh, it's even controversial as to whether his data was real. Um, well, what Sheng Jia showed, thank you. What Sheng Jia showed was that in his paper in Scientific Bulletin, that apparently this magnetic receptor that Z's lab had cloned was capable of controlling neurons in, wow, was capable of controlling neurons in, in uh, C. elegans. So he claimed to have expressed this channel in C. elegans and then by approaching the worms with with magnets he could change their behavior i'm not going to go into his results because that paper has been by consensus has been just labeled as fraud or at least theft um and then in 2015 a magnetic protein biocompass the paper comes out and that is the paper by Z's lab, XIE. And that was in 2015. So that's a pretty cool paper in Nature Materials. You can check that out. That's also in the link. The scientific bulletin paper is also in the link. Or in the description, excuse me. I'll put it in the description. <clears throat> and so 
again, the idea, there's two biological ideas here. The first one is that it would be kind of cool if we could find the magnetic protein, the protein basis for directional sense. Oh my goodness, is that annoying. You almost died, dude. Okay. So the weird thing is then, there's this, this idea, first of all, right, in biology that animals have a directional sense and that it must be magnetic. Now the other enticing idea here, and the reason why Sheng Zha got involved in it in the first place, is because there is a constant drive to update our ability to control neurons in the brain and updating that with respect to being able to non-invasively control neurons would be a significant advance. Recently we have managed to be able to control neurons with light but we still need to get the light into the brain so even though this manipulation is very much less invasive than electrodes and stimulation it's still not a completely uninvasive intact animal preparation you still need a light source and this kind of thing so optogenetics for example could never be used in a human therapeutically unless you could get to the stage where you could put blue lights or other colored LEDs into the human brain or a fiber into the human brain that would allow you to stimulate the place you want to stimulate assuming you could express channel redoptions express options in the brain assuming you could do that then and assuming you can put a light in there then maybe there's therapeutic purpose right for for options but magneto control of neurons is enticing because if you could express these proteins in particular neurons and just pass an electric field over the brain you wouldn't need you wouldn't need an open animal prep anymore right there would be no electrode there would be no headgear maybe even no surgery just express that transgenically and control the animals with control the neurons of question with magnets so that's enticing people want that that would be great to be able to do that and I think Z's lab was thinking that that you know if we could find this magnetic receptor it might have potentially all kinds of uses across fields bioengineering biosensing neuroscience I mean, the, the list is pretty endless. Especially when you then think about engineering changes in this protein. So then in 2016, another paper comes out from the University of Virginia. And this was from Ollie Guler's lab. And they claimed to have engineered a magnetic, a magnetically activated non-selective cation channel. TRPV4. Um, it's a it's a type of vanillinoid receptor, I believe, or ion channel. They're uh, they're a relatively obscure ion channel. I mean, we're not 
and not to say that they don't exist, but what they do for neurons and what they do for neurons in particular parts of the brain is very specific and how they contribute to whole neuronal function um, and brain function is still, you know, under, under investigation, but they're there. And some of them are magnetically, are ma mechanically activated. I guess that's what makes them so interesting is there are mechanoreceptors, right, that upon deformation of the membrane or deformation of whatever they're attached to, that they can, their ion channel will get. So the idea would be here to try to tie the, the gating to magnetism. And so they claim to have engineered this. And in this paper in 2016, they pretty much took neuroscience by storm because they show a lot of things in this paper that at first glance are fairly, fairly spectacular. And what they try to do is give some level, some evidence on several levels of analysis that these channels gate via magnetism. The first thing they do is they express them in cultured HEK cells, I think. And the HEK cells have a calcium signal, a calcium indicator in them. And when they stimulate the cell cultures with magnets, then they are able they are able to get the calcium signal in the cells transfected with the channel to change. So magnetism, they get a calcium signal increase. No magnetism, they don't get increase. Um, reverse the channel so that it doesn't transcribe and then they also don't get it. That first figure is very tiny, whoops. What is this lady doing? It's a very simple figure, it almost has nothing to it. But then you're going to find out that every figure in this paper is kind of like that. Or they could have shown you more, but they don't. And if they were getting what they say they were getting, it's not really clear why they wouldn't show you more. <clears throat> so a current injection of 300 picoamps in a brain slice is very similar to activation by a permanent magnet in a brain slice. This is again one of those figures where they show you less than you might want to see. It's less than thorough. But they show you some spiking. It seems to be aligned with the magnet. They show you a cumulative graph that shows that some neurons spike a lot, some don't. And that if they reverse the the transcript, then they don't get this magnetic firing. But there's not a lot of raw data in this figure. <clears throat> Just one example, really. And the rest is just dots in a distribution. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on! But the claim is there. They say it's equivalent to 300 picoamps injection. They just compare it to that, which is also kind of lame, right? You could imagine a scenario where they could use the electromagnet and graded the, the magnetic field. It showed that the graded magnetic field produces a graded response in the neuron, but they don't show that because I don't think they could get that. And they went cheap because that's all they could do. It might even be real data, I don't know. The fourth thing they show is that when it's, ex the third thing, excuse me, that they show is that when it's expressed in zebrafish larva, that the zebrafish larva, when they're under a magnetic field, they do more, they do more spontaneous uh, larva type movements. 
I don't know if they call it tail flicking or what they call it, but it's a uh, it's a what they see as an assay of here you got so many larvae and they're going to kick around a little bit and if we express the protein in there and they kick around a little more when the magnet's on but that's in vivo in in zebra fish they claim to do this so that was HEK cells then slices now in a zebra fish next thing they do is they say they express it in striatal neurons and they make recordings in vivo in a box that has magnets in the wall and when they do that they put that animal in the magnet box they see the firing rates of striatal neurons increase <clears throat> Again, if what they're claiming is true, this is a spectacular advance, right? And this is four figures now, HEK cells, and then, and then they do brain slices. Then they do zebrafish larvae, and then they do striatum in vivo recordings in a mouse. The final figure is shocking. The final figure, they put this protein in D1 positive neurons in the striatum. Then what they do, oh, wait a second. So what they do is they put, they claim to put this protein, the D1 receptor neurons in the striatum, similar to figure four, but now they're specifically in D1 cells. And if they put an animal in a two arm maze with one arm being magnetized and one arm not being magnetized, they get a positive place preference for the magnetized chamber and the animals expressing the magneto 2 receptor and that's pretty extraordinary that's pretty extraordinary so here you have five figures in nature, neuroscience, showing that this magneto-2 construct, which is a ferritin molecule coupled to a TRPV4 channel, can become a magnetic controller of neurons, a magnetic activator of neurons. That's an extraordinary claim and therefore would require extraordinary evidence. This year a paper came out from the University of Virginia from Julius Zhu's lab, J.J. Zhu. It's a one-figure smackdown of the 2016 magnetic paper, of Magneto 2 paper. Matters arising in nature neuroscience. They seem to test this protein pretty thoroughly, putting it in cultured neurons, cultured cells, comparing it to the expression to regular TRP V4 channels, and simply showing in a variety of ways that there are no functional magnetic receptors in these cells. The Magneto 2 has a construct, doesn't do what the 2016 paper suggested it did.
but not very good for the magneto paper. So I, when I find these kinds of things in science, I'm always sort of flabbergasted. You know, the magneto paper involves several people, slabs. Sure, there's one final author, but we all can see that there isn't a lab that is making a protein like Magneto 2 and then also able to do zebrafish and mice in vitro and in vivo. There, are, there is no lab like that. So the original Magneto paper is a big collaboration between a number of labs that either at one point had a functional channel that somehow was not able to be transferred to Julia Zhu's lab or there's a lot of very bad experiments going on, right? Because you can't have experiments in different laboratories going on simultaneously in different systems, different experimental models, and come up with corroborating evidence unless either it's real or there's a very consistent mistake being made. So I'm interested to see what else we can learn. There are other papers out there. And there are specifically other papers which use the protein that Z lab found in 2015 to try and create a similar magnetic actuator of neurons. And so we can couple, look at a couple of those papers maybe next week. Because I do think there is probably a protein biocompass. And for sure, it's not ridiculous to think of making a, an ion channel that can be gated by magnetism. Hey, I think it's a worthwhile goal from the perspective of trying to do invasive perturbation of neural systems. Non-invasive perturbation of neural systems is the way forward. That's why optogenetics is so valuable. That's why we like optogenetics so much right now because it's allowing us to test hypotheses in a much more specific way and even more direct ways by using genetics to target specific parts of the system. And so if we could do that with a magnet, it would be obviously fantastic. And the obviousness of this fantasticness is what I think creates this huge potential for faking data. I'm not saying anybody fake data. I'm saying the potential for faking data. Okay, so thanks for joining me on my ride. That was the Magneto 2 controversy. Um, the Magneto 2 paper came out in 2016, link in the description. Uh, the revisiting of Magneto 2.0 came this year, link in the description. Um, I referred you to an earlier paper or an earlier dispute involving Z's lab in China with another uh, researcher by the name of Sheng Jia Zhang. And Sheng Zha Zhang was accused of stealing the protein and the idea from Z's lab in China and publishing in Science Bulletin, also linked in the bottom. This was also covered in Nature's News. 
um, during the same year where Z's account was contrasted against Zhang's account. And seeing that I've worked personally with Shang Zha Zhang, I can speak from experience to say that Dr. Zhang is likely to be the shady one in this pair. Um, it's interesting to note that after this came out and after this moved forward, we haven't heard anything from Shang Zha's lab. And in fact, the only thing we have heard from him is a recent bioarchives paper where he claims to have found grid cells in the somatosensory cortex in deep layers. Um, that paper has not been officially published, I believe. It hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but it was put on bioarchive a couple, three, four, six months ago. Um, you might look that up too. If I can find the link for that bioarchive paper, I'll also put that in the links. Um, again, this is a cool paper and a cool set of papers from the perspective of biology and trying to find out how magnetic sensing might contribute to directional behavior in animals like pigeons and butterflies and other animals that show definite directional sense relative to the magnetic field of the earth. So they're not searching for a protein that probably doesn't exist, but what they are doing is now trying to take that protein or make a protein like that, which could be used to control neurons non-invasively. So there's two things going on here. First, this biological story of, of magnetic sensing and direction sense, and then this second idea where where the potential for the use of this protein or proteins like it as a tool in neuroscience has sort of propelled the onus to generate tools like this that might be able to be essentially a non-selective cation channel activated by magnetic fields. If it could be activated by a graded magnetic field, then we could have something almost as powerful as optogenetics, but then in some sense maybe even more powerful because we can do it through the skull without needing to bring light to the neurons. Um, if you liked it, like and subscribe to JC on a bike and I'll see you next time.